The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Using Legacy Planning to Generate Client Relationships that Go Beyond the Transaction. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we will send out both the slides and the recording to everyone who registered. We will also have a Q&A session at the end, uh, so please place your questions into the GoToWebinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll address as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. During our call together, uh, today, we're going to be covering the statistics around legacy planning, a new approach, the benefits for both the family, advisors, and attorneys, uh, the specific process, including stages and timeline, uh, and a hands-on exercise about creating a family mission statement, next steps, and the Q&A session that I mentioned before. It is my pleasure to introduce Matthew Blotmacher. He's the VP and Trust Officer at Peak Trust Company. He's been with the company for over 15 years, and he's an active member of the executive team, sits on the board of directors and the trust committee. And I'll turn it over to Matt. Well, thank you, Barbara, and thank you all for um, who joined us. And uh, good morning, good afternoon for those of you in later time zones. And I'd like to first start by saying I'm very excited to be on this webinar. Uh, this, this process and partnership between Peak and Giant has been years in the making, and um, we're, we're excited to, to see this process continue to grow. So first, I'd like to kind of start off by talking about why we invited you to join us today. And it's really to start a discussion about how the current way of doing things is, is imperfect and needs improvement. And what do we define as the, the old or the current way? Well, we're really talking about trust and estate planning, but financial planning overall. And we kind of define the traditional way of where the focus of the tax and legal and financial plan is, is very document driven. Um, there's not a lot of, of human involvement. Um, now, while this planning can't be minimized, and it's still absolutely crucial to the process, um, we believe fundamentally that there are additional components of planning that are needed. Um, planning that establishes a purpose for why we want to spend the time, the energy, and effort to create the tax, the legal, and the financial plans. And this additional planning involves the people who will ultimately manage and benefit from the assets. So we've defined this additional planning as, as legacy planning. So why legacy planning? Why do we believe it's, it's a, a better way forward? And it really starts with what is missed in traditional planning. Um, according to a study by Alliance, surveyed individuals placed values, life lessons as high priorities when creating estate plans. And I can tell you from personal experience, and I'm sure many of you can when working with clients, that many of them will say that values, life lessons, and experiences are items they wish to pass along to future generations. And many times they might tell you that those are more important than passing along the financial aspects. So if that's the case, why is there no conversation around making sure values, experience, and life lessons are transferred? Um, there's no discussion around this topic. And first, you might ask yourself, well, why? But it's, it's really that the traditional planning is maybe a little bit easier as far as conclusion. Um, legacy planning is not easy. It takes time. It can't be done in a day. And there's no clear end. Uh, if you create a trust document or a tax plan, it's got a clear conclusion. Um, legacy planning takes a little more time and a little uh, harder to gauge is when you are really done. And maybe you're never really done. It's just an ever-evolving thing. So from here, Barbara, if you can switch to the next slide. You might ask yourself, well, why do we need to consider a change? What's wrong with the current way that things have been done? And it really comes down to the statistics. They tell us why. According to a Williams Group study, 70% of intergenerational wealth transfers fail with the rate increasing to 90% after three generations. And there are some studies that put this rate at 90 plus percent even in the first generation. And in that same research, they concluded that only two to 3% of these transfers failed because of 
the result of document problems or improper tax or financial planning. And then the further in their research, it was found that 30% of families that were successful in one generation of transfer did so because they had a family mission statement and a plan to accomplish that mission. You might ask yourself, well, why does that matter? Why does simply having a mission statement significantly increase your chances of success? And I'd ask you to recall back to when you were a kid, and you had a parent, a teacher, or a coach that asked you to set goals. Maybe at the time you thought it was you know, fruitless and, and annoying. But the simple act of defining your goals helps with your long-term vision and short-term motivation to move you closer to realizing that goal. This goal setting, mission, and purpose is fundamental to the legacy planning process. <clears throat> and if uh, Barbara, you can advance to the next slide, please. So how did we get here? Um, through its work, Peak realized that traditional planning had a high failure rate, as we talked about in the statistics. And we could see that the families we had the opportunity to work with were wanting more. They had a desire to better define and protect their legacies. This led Peak to a partnership with a wonderful organization that got its start by helping businesses better define and achieve their purpose and mission, called Giant. The purpose of the partnership between Peak and Giant is to help families define, achieve, and protect their legacies. With this, I'd like to introduce you to Amy Norton, who's a senior associate with Giant. She works with Giant and focuses mostly on consulting to help businesses make their people better. Uh, she works not only with individuals and companies uh, to help them better understand their current reality and make meaningful changes. She really likes to focus on creating sustainable success and leadership. And she's here today to help bring her skills to the table that she's learned in working with businesses to help families move forward. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Amy. Thank you, Matt. I'm so glad to get to share this conversation space with you today. It's such an important topic, especially when we think about all the baby boomers transitioning uh, to their next generation. So thank you so much for the opportunity to partner with you in this and hello to everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee, where I make my home with my family. And it's been a great privilege actually to walk with Peak Trust in the, the leadership development process. So um, when I usually, people ask me what I do, I usually say I'm an adult behavior specialist and that usually elicits a laugh or two. Uh, but at the end of the day, Bottom line, what I'm focused on, as Matt said, and what Giant Worldwide is focused on is helping companies be better by helping their people be better. And whether we're working with a for-profit, not-for-profit, large, small, public, private, government entity, whatever the size of that organization, the universal issue always tracks back to people um, and helping leaders look at their people as assets and not liabilities. So when we think about the family legacy planning space, this is a natural place for somebody like Matt in his financial services sector to partner up with us to think about the bigger issues that are a universal part of, of all organizations and family structures. Um, and a little bit about Giant, we really believe that the world doesn't need more leaders necessarily. We, we believe that the world needs more of the right kind of leaders. Um, we know that there are dominating leaders who create abdicating cultures. Uh, there are protecting leaders who create mistrust and abdicators who create ineffect ineffectiveness and inefficiency. But the best leaders, which we term as liberators, create an empowerment culture where everybody has the opportunity to thrive, uh, where there is empowerment and opportunity. And that's a necessary part of a family unit as much as it is a corporate or organizational unit. Um, and our, our philosophy is really that people can only, leaders can only give what they possess. So it's incredibly important for the individual leaders to be healthy uh, in order to have that sustainable, scalable growth uh, and longevity in terms of family transition. So you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, or could, that there, those are some examples of the businesses that we work with. And great to go on to the next slide, Barbara. 
really what we do when we work with organizations is help develop people. And we do this in a process over time. You heard Matt say that uh, these things don't happen overnight. And when you're making change within an organization, especially in the relational dynamics department, which is where I orbit, there really is a necessary process over time. Um, and when we think about transferring legacy from one generation to the next, this is very evident. And we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit as we talk today. So I want to show you a couple of tools. Uh, we use very simple sticky visual tools in our giant world because we know adults are time pressed and distracted by multiple things. And uh, this, both of these tools give you a little bit of a window into some of the things we're using with our clients and very appropriate to our discussion today. So on the right, you'll see a tool that's called Know Yourself to Lead Yourself. And this infinity loop visual gives us an image of what it looks like to be on a continual behavior pattern perhaps without awareness around where our tendencies may be contributing to uh, good things in relationships or potential blind spots, blind spots and friction points. So our premise is that if we want to have healthy culture, we are the leaders, the leaders define the culture, we actually have to know ourselves to be able to lead ourselves because for good or ill, all of the things that we do as a result of deep-seated tendencies create behavior patterns and actions that have consequences and determine our reality. So if the reality is that we want to have a healthy family structure and a, a family unit that transitions wealth successfully 14 generations hence, then we actually, as the legacy leader, have to know ourselves really well, uh, not only what we want for our family, but actually what we're doing to create the family culture. And when we think about transferring, our values and our assets and our wealth, there's really a process over time that's best represented by that apprenticeship square. Uh, and this gives us a, a visual, this is the tool on the left side of the screen, a visual for the process over time where the legacy leader is running the business, managing the family, and begins to bring younger generations into the process where they intentionally participate in meetings, perhaps, in watching what the leader is doing, learning what it is that is valued and needs to be transitioned. Uh, so over a process, over time, we're able to take people with no awareness of what's needed to observing the process, to participating in the process, which is on that third side where I'm doing and you're helping if you're the, the next generation to finally a place where transition has been made complete and the new generation is now able to work from an automatic place. So those are just a couple of uh, the, the simple visual tools that are really based on some complex principles that we use to frame up uh, our engagements. And Matt and his company are very familiar with these. These are things that they've been using in the work we've been doing together. Let's move to the next slide. So when we think about adapting our process, we really begin from that, that simple idea of leaders knowing themselves to lead themselves and determining the process for making that transition. Um, so helping people hear and understand and value one another is a really important part of the process and something that we, we build a lot of time into intentionally helping people understand where they're coming from. We're going to get to sample a little bit of that experience today as we think about your creating your own personal mission statement. Let's move to the next slide, Barbara. I want to talk for just a minute about the kinds of things that we transfer and what it is that we want to pass on. And Matt alluded to this in his opening remarks, but it really is more about more than just the, the financial piece of the puzzle. So with this wealth trinity visual here, you're seeing sort of the three segments of what has to be passed on. And the financial piece, which is what you and our audience are most focused on, uh, are th this is the obvious piece. There's a, a substantial asset that needs to be transitioned to in a trust or whatever the vehicle is to the next generation. But there are actually two other pieces that are incredibly important to that successful transfer. Um, and that's the values piece and wisdom and intellectual wealth. So when I think about these things, I'm thinking about not only what the family values, but what every person involved, what the beneficiaries value. And when I think about wisdom, I'm thinking about the narrative, the family narrative. Um, who, who is the, 
the at the beginning of the family who created the business? Uh, what is the story? What are the experiences and the shared sense of of belonging that are part of the the current reality of the legacy leader and the future possibilities of future generations? And actually having a process to collect and aggregate and understand that narrative wealth is incredibly important to the legacy process so that everybody has a shared sense of, of belonging, a mutual sense of purpose. And the narrative piece of that is very important. Let's go to the next slide. And at this point, I'm going to pass the baton to Matt to talk a little bit about the goals once we understand those three pieces of the, the wealth trinity there, a little bit around the goals for planning. So Matt, take it away. Thanks, Amy. So this talks about you know what we really want to get out of legacy planning beyond what we might get from traditional planning. And by diving into you know, the individuals and the family, we hope to you know, avoid conflict, and infighting amongst the family, especially as assets start to transfer and future generations or excuse me, older generations step away and future generations or younger generations step in. And one common thing we, we hear even in tr the traditional planning process is that uh, legacy leaders or older generations don't want to spoil um, younger generations or remove their motivation for continuing to work. And we believe through this process, you can dig a little deeper into that. Of course, strengthen and protect the family, protect the assets and the estate, make sure there's a good plan for moving things forward, and of course, as always, minimize taxation. And if you, uh, we can look at the, the planning process, um, this concept of transferring more than just financial assets is not something unique to Giant and Peak Trust Company. Um, there are many you know, books and, and seminars that talk about transferring more than financial assets. And the, the difficulty in actually accomplishing that is, is the process, the plan. And we're fortunate to be able to work with Giant and uh, crafting a process that actually is uh, valuable to a family and really helps create a conclusion around the process. And we break this process up into what we believe is really a 10-step process with three main parts, uh, planning, decision-making, and conflict resolution. Um, steps one through six are under the planning phase, and you'd go through a preparation call and a survey. You'd involve all key family members or all those that were uh, desired to sit at the table. you goal set and go through round rules, and the third step would be mapping the family and personalities, which is personally one of my favorite parts. You get to really see what is uh, what is it that motivates each individual family member and see where there's some similarities and differences. Process four or step four would be the individual interviews where we try and discover each member of the families, their life plan and intention. What is it that they want to accomplish? Meaning five, we start to combine all the values from the individuals and put those into a shared family dream. Um, meeting six goes further into defining family values and causes. In step seven, we move a little more into the decision-making process, where we're trying to find what factors matter when deciding who will handle the family business, investments, and succession planning. During these stages, we would help to draft and really pin down the family mission statement and maybe even move into a family constitution, which is a little more involved and in depth. Um, and further, we look to put some formal structure around uh, the governance of the family and how certain decisions would be made. In step 10, it's really all by itself with just conflict resolution. Uh, this is one of the biggest pieces of um, the most important pieces of the legacy planning process and really is important when we think about how to manage the family wealth, how to transmit that wealth to the next generation, how business business succession might work. And um, really pin down um, some of the 
the major issues inside of the family. So we've talked about the process, and you might ask yourself, you know, what is the takeaway? If a family decides to engage in this process, what do they walk away with, other than hopefully all the goals that we previously set? Um, we would work with them to create, craft a family mission statement and constitution. We'd work with a partner to create video interviews and capture stories, which can be very powerful. Create a family narrative and tree. We'd set aside some items for a time capsule. And if trusts were going to be in the mix, we'd want to run through a distribution scenario uh, where we had a variety of situations that might arise and get structure and decisions uh, around each of those scenarios and also help the legacy leader or senior family members create a letter of intent or video intent that would help uh, future trustees better administer the trust. And all this helps to clarify mission and purpose. As we previously discussed, mission drives success. And on the next slide, I'll leave you back with Amy, who will talk about why it is critical to set a mission statement and how doing so increases your chance of success and really helps with the decision-making process. Thank you, Matt. It's a, this is such an important piece of the process for that, that family legacy transfer is really having clarity of purpose because the reality is when your purpose is clear, when your mission is clear, decisions are easy. So that is why we really focus on this as a big part of the, the family legacy planning process, coming up with that family mission statement. If we know why we exist, then we, we can make decisions about what we do with assets or how we, uh, how we fund a foundation, whatever, whatever the issue might be. So what you're seeing now here is a tool that Giant has developed to use for strategic planning purposes. Um, it's our organizational clarity tool and all the components you see here really touch the, the organizational structure or, or all the components of organizational structure. Everything from the, the philosophical things, why do we exist? Uh, what do we value uh, to roles and responsibilities in the middle uh, to tactical things in the, the bottom half. So strategy and structure and tactics. And when, when there's clarity at all levels of the organization across the board, philosophically and even down to a, do people know what to do every day, uh, there is an opportunity for you to make great strides toward reaching those goals. So this is what we use to frame our thoughts around the process. And what I thought uh, we would do for a few minutes now that we've introduced the big picture of why legacy planning is necessary and what some of those component pieces are is really thinking about what your personal mission statement is. Um, and to do that, we're going to think a little bit about values first. Uh, usually when I start working with executives and owners of companies and family members who are the legacy leaders, we always start from that personal, what do you value most? Um, and just a little high level definition, I think vision and mission are two words that can get confused in terms of what they what they mean and what they represent. So when we think about vision, this is actually a picture, a picture of an ideal future and vision statements answer the question, what do we want our future to be? So we're really thinking big picture. And I'm always fascinated with personality tendency here because some of us are hardwired to easily think and be focused on the future. And some of us are focused more in the present. Matt and I are examples of, of the opposites there. I, I'm very much focused on present details. Matt is naturally geared toward looking toward the big picture. So um, we, we always tie back to the personality place when we're working with families to help them understand what their, their orientation is for looking at the world. But the vision is that big picture uh, idea of where we want to be ultimately. Mission, which is a lot of what we're talking about today, is what we are charged to do in order to achieve that vision. So what actually must we do to make that vision a reality? Um, and then lastly, values are the beliefs or the guardrails that shape a culture or a family or an organization. And because leaders define a culture, it's so important for the legacy leader to know what they value and for that larger family unit to know what they value as a family. So some of the, the questions that are answered in this process are, what are our values? What is most important? Who are we? What do we stand for? And what do we want to be known for? So 
those are some simple ways of getting at the, the larger complex idea of coming up with a mission statement is really spending some intentional time working on answering those questions. And it's, it's easier to answer the big family question of what do we stand for when I know personally what I stand for. So I want to flip to the next slide for just a second and invite you, if you have a, a pen and a piece of paper, take just a moment and write down some of the values that are essential to who you are. And we're sharing this Wealth Trinity visual again to give you some categories to maybe think about putting that in. Um, if we were doing this as a real exercise, we would take a, a, a block of time and lots of words to give you some prompts to think about it. But if you think about financial, the financial side of life, uh, your experiences and where wisdom comes from, the, those key areas, so education, experiences, lessons, failures, family history, faith, religion, all of your relationships. Uh, what, what out of that bucket are things that you value? And then um, finally, just in general, what are maybe philosophical things that you value? Philanthropy, family, hopes for the future uh, in that category. So take just a moment and whatever's coming to your mind first is the right answer. You don't need to overthink it, but just jot down a few words of things that you know that you value. Um, and I think if I were doing this, certainly family would factor in as something that is a high value for me. Uh, intellectual wisdom, always being a learner, that's something that I value. So if that helps you with some prompts on, on what to think about there. Um, so jot those down and then let's go to the next slide, Barbara. As you're looking at those words, be thinking about who you are. And what do you stand for? What do you want to do? If you were thinking about your ideal future, what would that look like? Or giving you a nice uh, image of the ocean here with somebody really thinking about way far out on the horizon now there. So if you were actually doing this exercise, we'd be asking you to really flesh this out. What do you value? And how does this connect to the picture of the future you see for yourself? Um, and what are the kinds of things you need to do to be able to accomplish your goals? Now recognize we're, we're running through this in, in a very brief way, uh, just to give you a, an overview of what we're doing. But this is the exercise that we would take some time on individually. And then as a group, as a family unit, walking through a brainstorming process, a collaborative opportunity for people to share what they think personally, and then turn that toward finding some common denominators with the family. So uh, very often, uh, I'm always struck actually uh, the, at the common denominators that we find that, that add a unifying element to our organizations and to our families. When we did this exercise with Peak Trust, we found that there were several people who grew up on farms in Idaho and they did not know that. So there are always some fun little tidbits that uh, I think bubble up to the surface when we're thinking about our own personal values and then turning that attention toward what we value as, a, as an organization or a family unit. So I hope you've had a minute to, to jot a few things down. Um, and as on this next slide, I'll give you a, a couple of examples of a family mission statement and a personal mission statement. So uh, this is uh, a, a family who has had many generations to steward uh, and their goal is to be a 14th generation family company that is financially strong, intellectually progressive, and deeply committed to the well-being of our businesses, our employees, our communities, and each other. So if I were a family member, having done the personal values exercise, and I realized that I had a, a desire to be intellectually curious and a lifelong learner, you're seeing here that my words actually showed up in the mission statement here. Um, so that feels pretty good if I'm that family member. And then I also have an example from Denise Morrison, a CEO of the Campbell Soup Company. Her personal mission statement is to serve as a leader, live a balanced life, and apply ethical principles to make a significant difference. And the, the point being that these outcomes of personal mission statements and family mission statements are the product of some intentional reflection individually. Um, and then in the family case, coming together from a corporate place or a, a collective place to see a reflection of who we 
who we want to be and what we want to do to carry out that vision. And with that uh, little practical exercise under our belts, I want to turn it back to Matt. Uh, he has worked, th this is a case study from a, a, a family he worked with and some interesting things that were the result of this intentional process that we've been detailing to you. So Matt, I'm going to pass it back to you to talk a little bit, talk us through this case study. Thank you, Amy. And in the kind of refinement process of this partnership between Giant and Pete Trust Company, we were very fortunate to be able to walk through this process with a couple of families. In one family in particular, um, it was a, a mother, father, three children. All the children were in their 20s, and each was experiencing some transition in their life. Um, it was marriage, graduation, beginning of careers, and in some cases, um, all three. And there were some catalysts for why the family wanted to come to the table and really engage in this process. They wanted to help define the roles that children would play in the family business. They wanted to help define the family legacy and mission statement, introduce children to key advisors, and really understand the motivators and inhibitors for each family member, really get a better understanding of the family unit. And the results that came from that process are probably best um, represented by the quotes from the family members who walked through this process. Um, I personally find these quotes to be powerful and probably the, the best way to eliminate the value of legacy planning. This process really allows a family to go much deeper than what is traditionally done through right, traditional planning alone. And, um, it's, uh, Barbara, maybe we can move to the next slide. As you can see from these quotes, each member feels that they got a much better understanding of not only themselves personally, but the family unit, and really had a better idea of how to start working towards a mission statement for themselves personally and for the family. And so we move on to why would you encourage clients to engage in legacy planning? And it's part of Peak Trust Company's mission to define and protect family legacies. And that really comes from the desire to see families beat the stats, become more successful, and not fall into the 70% failure rate. Um, we want to provide families with a clear roadmap for decision making, the decision making process, and that's really done through the family mission statement. We want to help families reduce conflict, become stronger, and if you walk through this process with a family, you might find that there are some benefits in it for yourself in elevating your practice, becoming a go-to advisor, and being able to better collaborate with other advisors. So you might ask yourself, how do you know if your client is a good fit? You might see that a client has expressed a desire to involve future generations in planning. They've had some concern over family friction. You feel as though there's a lack of plan for transitioning the assets of the estate. And maybe you have a family that's experiencing some sort of major transition, you know, birth, death, career change, college graduation, those sorts of things. And if you have a client who is experiencing any one of, or maybe all of these factors, they might be someone interested in going through this process. And after all of this, we'd like to leave you with the following which is if we have a 70% plus failure rate in traditional planning, why should we be afraid to try something non-traditional? Anyone's told me in some of our early planning that all companies have a culture. Part of that culture is intentional and part of it is unintentional. And that can be transitioned to all families will leave a legacy, uh, whether you intend to or not. And some part of that legacy will be intentional or unintentional. But if you're not intentional, you might leave a legacy that you don't necessarily want. So with that, we encourage all families to be intentional about the legacy they want to leave. We've ended a little bit early today, 
Um, but we've got plenty of time for questions and answers. And uh, if you haven't done so already, feel free to submit them in the chat box to the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll be happy to answer them. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Amy. Um, a bunch of people have asked if we can print the slides or if there will be a replay. Um, we are recording this webinar, so we'll be sending those slides and the recording to you so you can print them and share them with other people in your firms. Um, Amy, we have a question for um, someone wants to know how long this process takes. Could you give us an overview? So I can take that. Um, the process is unique to the family uh, and every process is a little bit different. And I don't mean that to be unnecessarily vague, uh, but we we would usually anticipate plus minus a year. Uh, transformation is a process over time. And when we're thinking about transforming a family from simply just wealth transfer to the values legacy transfer, a wider scope that we've been talking about today, we know it takes time. It takes time to build that narrative, time for leaders to understand themselves, know themselves, if you will. So we know that it's not something that happens in a month. Uh, so I like to gauge people's expectations to at least a, a year process. And sometimes if it's a, a very complex family structure, uh, it can take a little longer than that, but at, at least a year. Great. Matt, can you talk us through how the attorney would sort of fit into this process and how they work with Peak? Absolutely. We really view that in many cases, um, the attorney is already working with the family on their estate and financial plan. And they may be the first person to either introduce this topic to or that a family might start inquiring to an attorney about what this process is like. Is there more that can be done than just the traditional document drafting? And they would really be, in our mind, the quarterback of this process. Uh, they would bring the, the all the players to the table, so to speak, and be that kind of go-to advisor for the family. Um, Peak and Giant are here to help, you know, fill in the gaps, so to speak, um, and rather than take over that relationship. Great. Uh, Amy, can you talk to, uh, there's a question about, is all of this done in person? Is it done over the phone? Is it done online? How does this process actually happen? That is a great question. As much as possible, we do things in person. Uh, the, there's a great value in having that face-to-face -face contact uh, and time on the ground with families. So we believe very much in spending time in the natural habitat of the families that we're serving. Uh, but we also sometimes are constrained with schedules. So it, sometimes we do some interviews over a video chat. Uh, what we know is that if you have eye contact and can see facial features, you relay a whole lot more of the communication than just over a phone call. So occasionally we'll have phone calls, but if we can't be on the ground with people, then we will opt for a video conference. Perfect. Um, and there's a few questions about uh, the fee around this service. Can you talk a little bit to that? Yes. So the fee around the service is also similar to answering the question around how long this process takes. It varies depending on the complexity. Um, we answer those questions after we have a little more information from you about your family or your client to be able to, to gauge what is realistic in terms of the time that it will take. Um, and we'll build a pricing structure around that. And obviously, if for the, the financial side of things where there are trust documents being developed and executed and, and that side of things, you have a general understanding of, of those costs. Um, and the, the, uh, the legacy side, the values and wealth transfer side of that wealth trinity would fall in line with that. Perfect. Uh, there's a question in terms of timing. How much time did you say the process focuses on the financial side of things versus the values and wisdom and other pieces of the wealth trinity? I think, again, it is when we begin an engagement, uh, we go through a discovery process and 
it takes a little while to figure out who all needs to be interviewed um, and what 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 all the pieces and parts are. Um, we usually will spend a day or two at a time with people and we, we have some understanding of what information overload is for people. So we would not take a legacy leader through a leader intensive where we're doing a deep dive on personality, for example, followed by several hours of, of interviewing. Um, it would never feel like a deposition. It's not that kind of intensity. Uh, but when we're asking people to think through telling story, uh, it is it is taxing to to dig back through your your memory bank. So we are we are understanding of uh, what reasonable time is on a, a day to day basis. Um, and I, I think on average, we're probably spending several days, whether that's on the ground or metered out over several visits in person and video phone calls, probably maybe two or three days with a legacy leader just to get to know them and get the process started. Um, that That's where we would begin. Right. And again, it's hard to, to answer this without having specifics of a family in front of you to be able to map that around. Right. And, and I would just add to that by, by saying you know, each family comes to the table in different stages of the planning process. Yes. Some may have a very well crafted, um, you know, tax, legal, and financial plan, and they're really just looking uh, to bolt on the legacy planning. Some may have had some event in life, maybe the sale of a business, and you know, there's now this, this catalyst to do the entire planning process. So um, unfortunately, it's probably one of those answers of, it depends on each specific family situation. Right, Amy, uh, you would use a term that uh, someone's asking you to define legacy leader? Mm -hmm. Yes, so legacy leader would be the the patriarch of the family or the matriarch of the family, whoever is the the person with the most gray hair, <laughs> I think. Uh, so whoever is the head of the family, um, and maybe they are running the business if there's a family business, or maybe they are the person people look to to make decisions or seek out for wisdom when decisions have to be made. Great. Does that help? Yeah. Um, Matt, do you train advisors to do this? Is the question that we got. Um, we, we have, Peak Trust Company does not formally train advisors. I mean, obviously there's a lot of, of training that they would get through the experience of going through this process. Um, Giant has specific training for someone who wants to become more involved with this process. And for anyone interested, I would highly encourage you to reach out to Amy um, and to find out more about that. And I can piggyback on that. We are launching some specific training that is for practitioners and not consultants in our giant world. So if you're a, if you're working within the, the giant entity as a consultant, there's a consultative training and apprenticeship track, but we know that there are lots of people out there in the world who would benefit from having access to some of our curriculum and training materials. So we actually, uh, in the fourth quarter of this year, are going to be launching some uh, user license related accessible materials that people will be able to have and use with their, whatever their training that they need to do with their clients. Perfect. So, Matt, um, I, oh, another question about the specific role that the advisor plays in this process. How would you describe that? I would say that, again, it's unfortunately kind of one of those answers of it depends. They could be as involved or, um, or uninvolved as they wish. But any advisor uh, bringing, you know, a relationship to this process uh, would really be in the driver's seat. Um, they would help the family walk through this process in many cases would be involved in all if not a significant portion of, of the family meetings and uh, again would really be that quarterback. Perfect. I think we've addressed uh, most of the questions that we got today. I want to thank Amy and Matt for their time and for everyone for attending. Um, again, we are sending out the recording and the slides so everyone will have access to that. 
um, as well as contact information for Matt. If you have a client that you think might be a good fit for this process, then um, Matt's the right person to talk to. And um, thanks so much for your time, everyone. We really appreciate it.